I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Pat Crosscarry, a professor of emergency medicine and director of the Critical Thinking Program in the Division of Medical Education at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Dr. Crosscarry has written a perspective article about cognitive bias and clinical decision-making. Dr. Crosscarry, you note in your article that the rate of diagnostic error in modern medicine is about 10 to 15 percent. How has that rate generally been understood, and what's medical education been doing to address it? It's interesting. There are two immediate reactions that I can think of. One is outrage that medicine should be making diagnosis is considered arguably the most critical thing that a physician does. So when these rates were announced, you might have imagined people saying that we just don't believe it, or equally they might have said, this is intolerable and we must do something about it. We didn't really, or I didn't really, from my own experience, didn't run into anybody who said they didn't believe it, which kind of surprised me, because when I first heard those figures, I was a little surprised myself. The original numbers were cited in a paper by Graeber and Berner and also led to the formation of the first conference on diagnostic error that was held in Phoenix in Arizona. That was about five years ago and that conference has been held ever since. So the reaction from that part of the medical community at least that's interested in this has been very positive and the conference has gone forward each year and actually led to the formation of the, the Society for Diagnostic Error. So the people, the members of the choir, if you like, who were interested in this area have sort of pushed it a lot further. Ten years ago, for example, nobody was talking about diagnostic error. And in fact, Bob Wechter mentioned in the Institute of Medicine report at the turn of the century that kind of triggered the patient safety movement. Medication errors in that report are mentioned over 90 times, and I think diagnostic error was mentioned twice. So overall, I think it's been well received by the medical community. There hasn't been disbelief. It's been picked up in the media significantly and led to a number of articles being published and research being done that is pushing the whole area forward. So that's how I think it's been received, and I'm very happy with the reaction. You've been studying cognitive and affective bias for some time. What first drew you to it, and how's your research been applied in medical training? I came into it, I think there were two clear reasons. One was that I had previously trained as a psychologist before I went into medicine, so I had some sort of sensitivity to the way that people think. And then the second thing that happened was that I became head of a department and an emergency department. And of course, as soon as you become head, all the complaints in the department go across your desk, whereas normally physicians don't go around the place discussing their mistakes. So suddenly I was seeing all these mistakes and, well, not all of them. It was a busy department, so we had enough. And I started trying to categorize them. What struck me was that some very competent physicians were making some very simple errors sometimes. So I started grouping them into different categories and then eventually it occurred to me to go to the psychology literature and see what they said about this and then of course found that they were very well described in mainstream cognitive psychology. So I wasn't inventing anything new. I could then fit these different categories that I had into the general sort of psychology framework. So that's how we started categorizing them and giving them names and talking about them or applying names to them that existed in the cognitive psychology literature. And then in terms of how do we teach it or what do we do about it, I think there are two important things to do. One is to talk about how doctors actually make decisions. And in spite of the fact that if you talk to many doctors, they will tell you that this is the most important thing that they do is actually make decisions mostly about either diagnosis or how they're going to manage a patient. Very few physicians, if any, actually get exposed to a comprehensive course in clinical decision making while they're undergraduates. So what we did at Dalhousie We set up a critical thinking program, which is just about trying to get doctors to think more critically. And part of that program is a coaching, a teaching of how decision-making actually works, the current models of decision-making. And then we teach them about the biases, the cognitive biases, the affective biases. There are many of them. There are 
probably over 100 described in the literature, and we show how they apply to clinical cases, that we have a bank of clinical cases, and each of them illustrates at least one, and usually several of these cognitive biases. So teaching about decision-making and teaching about biases and teaching about how you fix biases, how you de-bias yourself, is an important part of this critical thinking program at Dalhousie. So the examples you give in your article reveal clinicians who quickly get stuck on a particular diagnosis or a way of thinking about a patient and then interpret all the signs and symptoms from that narrow perspective. Is that the primary pattern you see? I don't think I would call it the primary one. What you described there are two biases together that are fairly, they do fairly frequently occur together. One is anchoring and failing to adjust. So the physician anchors onto the initial information and then it's been described in various ways. Some people talk about tunnel vision. Once they see a particular problem in a particular way, they can't shake off that initial impression. That's called anchoring and adjustment. And then the second one is confirmation bias, which compounds the first one because as soon as you start to believe that something is the case, then there is a natural tendency to look for information that will support that original belief that you have. And that phenomenon is called confirmation bias. So you've got two biases working together. One is anchoring and the other one is confirmation. But those are only two biases. As I said, there's there's probably at least about 50 or so that you can apply in medicine. And they take a variety of shapes and sizes. (laughs) There's an awful lot of them. And those two, anchoring and confirmation bias, are certainly prominent. I wouldn't say that was always what happened at all, but they certainly are prominent in cognitive errors. Another, in some cases, the trigger for the physician's line of thought is stereotyping the patient. For instance, a patient with mental illness, a history of substance abuse, hypochondriasis. Is that kind of thinking easier to overcome? Well, I think so. First of all, some of those other biases that we've mentioned, anchoring and confirmation and some others, are actually, uh, there's a strong argument made that these are evolutionary adaptations of cognition that, you know, 100,000 years ago, when the brain was probably undergoing some significant evolution, that these sorts of cognitions survive because they had tremendous adaptive value. If you, for example, as far as anchoring goes, if you anchored on to early signs of danger and acted accordingly, then your genes would get into the next generation. That sort of argument, and that comes from the evolutionary psychologist. Now, the biases that you just mentioned, the social stereotyping biases, like patients with psychiatric illness, drug seekers, even stereotyping against people who are obese, morbidly obese and people who are aging. All of those are sort of social stereotyping type biases. And I think it's easier to train people to overcome those than it is to undo some of the evolutionarily established biases. Let's take the psychiatric patient. Psychiatric patients, there's no question that they are discriminated against in the healthcare system. There are studies which show that if you have a psychiatric patient admitted to a medical facility for a non-psychiatric reason, you know, they come in because they've got a breathing problem or a cardiac problem, that those patients will undergo almost double the number of adverse events than a non-psychiatric patient. And there's lots of different reasons for that. But you imagine that in there somewhere is somebody who has beliefs about psychiatric patients and the credibility of their symptoms if they're complaining of something. In fact, uh, Jerry Hoffman, who's a prominent emergency physician, says the question he asks is, how do you get yourself misdiagnosed when you go into an emergency department? And he said, you say, first of all, I'm a schizophrenic and I have central chest pain radiating into my left arm and so on. And he's quite right that if people know that the patient has got psychiatric illness, they're more likely to modify their interpretation of their symptoms. And that is a a stereotyping type bias. I think you can deal with those better than you can with some of the other hardwired, what we think are hardwired biases like anchoring and some of the others that the psychologists have talked about. So how do you as a medical educator help physicians and trainees to avoid these patterns? Well, as we mentioned earlier, I think you have to do a couple of things. First of all, alert people 
to, you have to raise consciousness about this. You have to make people aware that this is a big problem. I think it's fair to say that most physicians out there underestimate the impact of biases on their thinking. Medical students underestimate it, residents underestimate it, and practicing clinicians, all of us, underestimate just how pervasive biases are in our everyday lives and in whatever we do for a living. If we're practicing medicine, we have to accept that there's an awful lot of bias out there. And you almost need a sort of feral vigilance to keep an eye open for it all the time and the impact that it has on your clinical practice. So we do that first. We tell people the extent of these biases, and then we teach the students how the model of decision-making works, and we also teach them specific strategies on debiasing. So the debiasing basically works. Step one is you have to detect the bias, first of all, which means being aware that they can happen and look for them. And then secondly, you have to know how to deal with that specific bias. So just going back to our previous example, say we're talking about psychiatric patients in emergency. Those patients, for example, usually get under-examined. So if I'm working in the emergency department and I have a psychiatric patient come in, knowing that there is a general bias against psychiatric patients and knowing that people don't listen to them fully and that they under-examine them, then one way of dealing with that bias is to have a forcing function where you say, whenever I get a psychiatric patient, I will attend very carefully to what they're saying and I will also examine them more fully than I might otherwise do for a non-psychiatric patient. So that's bringing in a sort of bias that counters the, the bias that you know that exists. But first of all, you have to be aware of the bias, and then you need to have what the psychologists call the mind wear, this sort of cognitive strategy for actually dealing with a particular bias. What's turning out to be the case, it seems, from the debiasing literature, that each bias probably has to be treated individually on its own characteristics, that you can't just have a universal debiasing strategy. You need to develop specific strategies to deal with specific biases, and I think that applies to us all, not just people in medicine, but debiasing is a very challenging business, and it can't be achieved lightly. If you doubt that, imagine how many times you've lost your car keys. I mean, I lose my car keys all the time, and I have a tendency to do that because you, as soon as you get into the house in the evening, you get distracted, put your keys down somewhere, and that bias of inattention and it doesn't matter until the next time that you have to try and find those keys. So the forcing function is to always put the keys in the same place every time you come in the door and maybe even have a little rack for the keys to go up. And that's a forcing strategy that deals with your tendency or your bias to lose your keys. But, but even people who've developed those corrective strategies, they still forget. They still put their keys down somewhere else. So it's a kind of lifelong obligation to de-bias yourself. It's something that you probably have to stick to on a sort of chronic basis. So is a broad answer for clinicians that once they've reached a preliminary diagnosis, they should routinely question it? I think that's a good overall strategy. Some of my colleagues always, whenever they reach a diagnostic endpoint, say to themselves, what else could this be? And always challenge themselves. Now, you know, that can get a bit tedious if you have something that's very obvious. On some patients, for example, that we see in emergency medicine, the diagnosis is unequivocally a certain thing. If they have a nail through a finger, you don't start worrying about other systems. You arrange to get the nail out, avoiding any biases that may be involved in that process. But there are times when it simply isn't necessary to question your diagnosis, but you have to be careful. Being simplistic about symptoms Symptoms is not something you can relax with. So, for example, in the case of taking a nail out of somebody's finger, there's really no question that that can be anything else, that that's what it is, unless they fail to tell you that they've got a nail somewhere else in their body. For example, if somebody comes in with a complaint like constipation, it's a great mistake to think that this is very simple and straightforward and all I have to deal with is constipation because we know that maybe the only sign that you get when a patient presents for medical attention, that very simple 
what appears to be a simple problem is in fact a lot more complicated than it looks and it may be that that patient has got an obstructing cancer or something wrong with neurological their nerve supply to their bowel or could be anything so I think it's a reasonable strategy to just run that universal forcing function by yourself every time you reach a diagnosis and say just step back from the immediate situation and say what else could this be is this something I could be missing a lot of the time will be redundant, but now and again, something will come up that you would have missed. Are there ways in which technology, such as decision support systems, for example, can help clinicians be sure they get the full picture before they head down a specific diagnostic path? Yeah, I think that's a good question to raise because decision support systems have been around for a long time. People tend to think of them as something new, but in fact, we've had them for about 30 or 40 years. Part of the reason that they don't get used as much as you would think they should be used is because physicians see it as a bit of an encumbrance to load information into a system so that they will get a differential diagnosis. Physicians have resented the amount of time it takes to engage a decision support system, especially if they think they know what's going on anyway. So that's why there is some inertia against it, or that's the biggest sort of point of inertia I'm aware of, as well as the financial concerns some people will have about buying these systems when medical training should be enough. But there's no question that doctors do miss things on the differential diagnosis that might be critical. So what I'd like to see is ways in which all the relevant information can be put into the decision support system by somebody other than the physician, say, so that they don't spend their time, clinical time, feeding information in. I think that would be helpful and might help us overcome this. But down the road, I think we're definitely heading towards this. You probably saw the Watson IBM computer take on the two champions in jeopardy and defeat them. And I don't think there's any question that the medical Watson will be highly effective, providing that all the appropriate information is fed into it. I think that sort of decision support system could be the ultimate one. And in fact, I was giving a talk on decision making about six months ago, and somebody came up to me and said, you realize you're going to be out of a job in the future, and because Watson, medical Watson is coming along. Well, that may be true, but I do think that the physician will still play a critical role in the interpretation of material that comes out of the decision support system. But I do see enormous benefit down the road for us there. Thank you, Dr. Crosskerry.